So we find ourselves at the final session of Communicate 2023. Um, really warm um, thank you to everyone who's joining us online and um, there's so many of you. Um, great to know if you've been here for three days or joining us this afternoon. It's an absolute honor to welcome Solitaire Townsend as our final speaker, not just of today, but of this year's conference. It seems incredible to believe that the last time I invited Solitaire to the stage was to close Communicate in 2009, where she was already top of her game, leading and inspiring so many of us in the sector. And when we set this year's theme as Together for Nature, of the 100 speakers who have given their time online and in person over three days, she was the one we rang and invited first to close it down. Um, if you don't know, Solitaire, she is the founder of Futera, she is Chief Solutionist at Futera, which is a fabulous title, and I hugely recommend her book, The Solutionist, if you haven't come across it yet. But, Solitaire, over to you. Thank you so much. Hello, folks. And wow, final speaker after all of this incredible content here in London, in Bristol, in Manchester. It's quite a big ask. I'm feeling a bit sweaty. Um, and I had my usual stick, you know, I've got my 25 slides, could pretty much do it in my sleep. Most of my poor team could probably do that speech just as well as I could. They've listened to it as, as many times. And I decided I'm not going to, because this is a room and an online room of communicators. And so actually I can have a bit of a different conversation with you than I would usually do when I was speaking to policymakers or to businesses or to brands or to activists. So there's a few things I just thought I might share to close this out, and I'm going to try to make sure there's time for, um, uh, for some questions as well. And whilst I was sitting here listening to these amazing interventions that we've had this afternoon, a really powerful memory came back to me, because of course we're here to talk about Together for Nature. Now, I was raised in a quite nasty little council estate just north of London, not very nice, um, where nature was a reality that had to be dealt with. So when it was cold, it was cold in the house. If it rained, it might mean that the wood that we put in the wood burner um, uh, would, would get wet, where insects and nature would come into the house and quite a lot of effort was put to try to keep the rats out, where you where you ate partly what was grown in the garden because it was cheap and you could grow it but you desperately wanted the packaged product with the plastic on it because that was what was aspirational and so i lived with nature i lived alongside nature i probably had a childhood which was more connected to nature not necessarily by choice but was more connected to nature than a lot of people do but i didn't have an emotional connection to nature until one particular moment so uh, every year we would go to pick um, uh, uh, berries, we'd go to, to, to get the berries so that my mum could make blackberry jam, and the blackberry jam would be the only jam that we would have um, throughout the year and also she could sell it, homemade blackberry jam. And so as three kids we would go out blackberrying into all of the areas, all the nat natural areas, all the um, sort of brown field, grey field sites, I think you'd call them now, essentially where brambles do really chainsaw and we'd cut these big holes in them every year before they um before they fruited because it would increase the amount of surface area to fruit and then the little children us as kids we'd we'd crawl in with bags and collect the fruit hated it hated every living second of it it sounds really rural and beautiful it sucks um probably are really 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 they're infested with lots of different insects most of which bite and when you get hurt you're not sure whether it's a bramble that's got you or something that's stung you and, you know, after about three handfuls of blackberries, all you want to do is throw up pink. Um, and, but you've got to collect it all because they go off. And so you've got to get them at the moment. And I crawled in and um, I got caught in brambles. And I mean, really caught hair caught up, clothes caught up, scratched down my leg and like wasn't able to move. And I shouted my younger sister to go and get my dad to come basically chainsaw me out and be able to pull me out. But I knew I wasn't going to be able to move for a little while, so basically just there, stuck in brambles, sort of having a little weep at how sad I was. And I saw an ant, 
and you know, bored, nothing to do, I watched and I watched the ants. And I watched the ants crawling up and I watched the ants crawling around. So like that, I watched the ants going for some of the fruit and not the others, no idea why. And then I saw that they were all in little lines, walking away, walking around. And then I realized that the whole area that I was in was this other universe. There was this whole other universe, this whole other reality, this whole other community of this huge number of ants who had almost sort of this science fiction universe. And they had no idea who I was and I hadn't noticed them until that moment. And I had this deep moment of awe about nature deep moment of actual connection to the fact that there is this magnificent, incredible, unparalleled, alien, close, nat natural world all around us. And in many ways, that's what put my feet on the path to means I can now stand on platforms like this. That moment of awe is absolutely crucial in how we communicate about what we do because we spend so much time communicating about the danger, the statistics, the worries, the facts, the um, anxieties, the this is going to happen, that this is failing, that we sometimes forget to communicate the absolute awesomeness of nature that is around us. And it's absolutely crucial because we know that if a child doesn't have a moment of awe in nature before they're about 11, they will not care about nature for the whole rest of their lives. They might intellectually engage, they might sort of mentally understand the necessity of nature for pollination, the un you know, business case for nature, but they won't ever care. And by the way, that moment of awe doesn't have to be going out camping in a natural environment and having sort of a deep moment. It doesn't have to be getting caught in brambly bushes. Like that moment of awe can actually happen even in a zoo. As long as a child gets that moment of being out of self, which is essentially what awe is, is taking you out of self and into this sense that there is other things and magnificent within the universe. So I wanted to share that because we're here to talk about communication and there's so much to talk about and I wanna share some practicalities with you and some insights, but just whilst I was sitting there, it just reminded me of where all of this started for me, which was in that moment of awe about the fact that an ants are living their own entire universe of stories and experiences and a way of interacting with the world that I will never understand and how magnificent that is. So in the many, many years since that moment, as I was just reminded, <laughs> 2009 wasn't even the start of my career. In the many, many, many years since, I've had the privilege of working with so many different storytellers and communicators with many of the organizations which are in this room with big brands with hollywood studios but the work that we do with futera is very much focused around how do we change the story and this is about storytelling that's what it's always about and stories are always about emotions that's what they are. That story that I just told you doesn't tell you anything about actually ant colonies or blackberry bushes, but it's a story. It's an emotional story. It's a story of a person. And a person does not have to be a human person. A person can be the emotional connection with anything that feels like there is an emotion associated with it. I was just joking to Roger Harobin, I was going, well, how would you tell the story of an, of an ice cap? It's like, I'd call it Bill and say that it cries when it melts because just by bringing that emotional aspect in, you're going to capture people. But the same emotional story doesn't capture us all as in the same way. Now, you know this, you are communicators. You know that the thing that motivates and engages you on this topic is not guaranteed to engage everybody. I really wish a lot of the rest of the climate community understood that that actually the thing that motivates us may not motivate the rest of the public. Because what tends to happen is that people try to communicate the thing that motivated them in increasing levels of urgency, and then feel like a failure themselves, get bitter and decide that everybody else is stupid and horrible and doesn't care about, the, about nature. Whereas in fact, the burden is on us to think about what is it that's gonna capture the attention, the hearts, the imagination of other people. Now I wanna give you, a, there's a, there's so many amazing breakdowns in terms of audiences 
on these topics. But one that I tend to come back to again and again is Pat Dennis. is not necessarily because it's particularly helpful in terms of targeting audiences, but because it's a great way of reminding me that I'm one of these audiences and I sure as fuck am not the other ones. And that actually I have to stop trying to tell other people the story that would motivate me. So Pat Day breaks all of society down into three groups. He'll call them prospectors, pioneers, and settlers. I'm dyslexic, I can never remember that because there's two Ps. And so I call them greens, bricks, and goals. Now greens are a small part of society, they're up to a quarter, and greens live in a big world. The world for the Greens is the world. They are as interested as what's happening in sea level rise of Bangladesh, in what's happening in the Arctic tundra, in what's happening in the Amazon, as they are in what's happening here in the UK. Sometimes more interested in what's happening in those other places in the world because they can see the evidence about why those things matter more for the overall stability of our biosphere and life on Earth. The word change is a good word to these people. It inspires them, it excites them. Change is something which when they say, we're gonna change everything, to them that sounds like a promising, exciting thing. It doesn't even occur to them, it sounds like a threat to other people. They tend to be very driven by ethics, by, uh, by new, by pushing boundaries, um, and they tend to be very suspicious of the mainstream. They tend to be suspicious of anything that's mainstream. So Greens tend to be the first to do something and then the first to stop doing it. So the Greens tend to be the first to buy a hybrid car and the first to say, actually, hybrid cars are not the answer. We need to go fully electric. The first to buy an electric car and the first to go, actually, we need to totally demotorize our societies and get rid of cars. In some communities around the world where I work, where recycling is brand new, and where there hasn't been a recycling infrastructure before, the Greens are the first to use the recycling infrastructure to talk about it being fantastic, to push for its adoption. They're also the first to say, actually, recycling is an end of pipe problem and we've got to deal with, with the sources of waste. So the moment something becomes mainstream accepted or an accepted way of doing things, the Greens are pushing for whatever's next. And that's necessary and really, really powerful part of society. The exact opposite of the Greens, I call the bricks. The bricks live in a very small world. So the reality, the world for the bricks, are the people that they know. The people, their neighbours, the people they meet in, in the school playground, the people at work, the people down the shops. Geography is community for them. Whereas for the Greens, geography is interest and values. I would have as much in common with someone who feels the same way about the world as me, who lives in Bangladesh, as with someone who lives next door. Now for the Greens, the word change is an attack, it's a threat, it's not a promise. So when you say we're going to change everything that does not sound exciting the Green, it sounds like you're going to take a lot of things that they care about away. And Greens tend to look to the past, so Bricks tend to look to the past for inspiration rather than to the future. Now, neither, neither of the, those two groups are better or worse morally. These are just world perspectives. And so Bricks, tend to be very activated by local nature issues, by the local park, by a tree, a beloved tree that got cut down, by, by um, pollution on the streets, by dog mess. But it's very, very difficult to get those bricks to care about something like climate change, because to be honest, the rest of the world is practically mythological. It's almost like it doesn't exist, because only what they've seen and visited exists. So it's not that they deny climate change per se, they sort of don't really think about things on that scale. And you can imagine that sometimes these bricks and these greens are in the same family. And you can imagine it doesn't always go well. And of course, in our social and in our political space, we almost have got a fight between the greens and the bricks at the moment in terms of perspective about what matters. Of course, these are both very strong value positions. In fact, Often a brick might know that the little old lady who lives next door is having difficulty getting out and about and getting her shopping. Um, it's probably helping. 
The brick might know that there is a really worrying thing happening in terms of the local park or in terms of a bypass or what have you, and they might get involved. Whereas the green might be very involved in some massive issues around rights and equity at a global level, but might not know that the little old lady who lives next door is having difficulty getting out and about because the green doesn't connect to geography, connect to thought. Now, some of you in this room might be green, some of you in this room might be bricks. The vast majority of the public, more than half, are neither, they're golds. And the golds don't live in a big world, and the golds don't live in a small world, they live in a world of one. It's what Jung would call an outer directed person, somebody who gets their sense of self by what others think of them. And so a gold is very motivated by status, by success, by fun, by being part of the zeitgeist, by being socially acceptable, which means if it is socially acceptable to care about nature, they will care about nature and act on it. If it's socially unacceptable to care about nature, if it's considered weird or extreme or outsider, then they won't because they live and die by what other people think of them. Now, at some points, particularly in rooms, which is mainly green or mainly brick, which tends to be the environment movement, some people push back on that. When I'm in rooms full of marketers, particularly for brands, they're like, oh yeah, no, it's more than half. It's at least two thirds. Because I'll give you an, an evidence point for how many golds there are. Over one third of British women either have had, are saving up for, or deeply desire a boob job. One third of British women. Just for one moment, think about the money that a boob job takes, the pain, the time, the risk, the huge effort it takes for your body to be, different, to be seen differently by other people. That's how powerful that desire to be seen well by others are. And by the way, at this point, I have to mention, I have not had a boob job, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Someone, someone's losing it over there. Oh my God. Um, uh, so I, just, I got asked this about three times after sharing this, and I thought, I'm just going to clarify it from now on. Um, but one of the, th but so this is absolutely important, but actually don't think of a sort of, you know, a Kardashian following person as being a gold. Where do you think amb ambition comes from? Great deal of ambition, great deal of the ambition that it takes to become a political leader or to become a CEO comes from the desire to be seen well in the eyes of others, to have profile, to have success, to have status. And so most of our political leaders, leaders and most of our business leaders are goals. So they are primarily motivated by what other people think of them rather than by any extant evidence, which means when you go to them and show them the evidence and then wonder why this smart, powerful, informed person is not taking an obvious logical decision, it's because you haven't thought about how it's going to make them look in the eyes of others. So those three groups are really important when we're thinking about nature. Now, you'll know that you're a green if you're sitting there plotting how to convert the other two groups to being greens. It's a very, very green perspective. Um, you'll know you're a brick if, like, basically, if I ask you to put up your hand, there's no fucking way I'm putting my hand up. Bricks do not put their hands up. And there probably aren't that many golds in here, although, you know, I own far too many pairs of trainers to not at least have a bit of gold in me. When we go out there and try to tell the stories that we're telling, almost always it's greens talking like a green, expecting everyone else to respond like a green. We're very, very, very much within that bubble. Sometimes if we're in an organization that has a heritage focus or an organization that's very locally focused, we might talk to the bricks. So very, very rarely do we talk to the golds. So very rarely do we make the issues that we care about feel mainstream, glamorous, cool, desirable. Um, I'm sure many of you in the last week will have seen the Kardashian bra. So I seem to have a very big boob th th um, thing going on. Who's seen the Kardashian bra? Okay, a couple of people. So there's literally two golds in this room because the Kardashian bra has been the biggest thing for climate change for months. 
So Kim Kardashian has come out with a bra that has got nipples built into it so that it looks like your nipples are erect all the time because as it gets hotter because of climate change, as climate change destroys our, our, our weather, we're going to have to actually kind of look, it's going to be too difficult to look cool and to look sexually desirable. So Kim, that's Kim Kardashian has done a massive advert about that. It's laughable, it's silly, it's fun, but with that one thing, she has made more conversations about climate change amongst the Greens than many of us whose actual job it is has managed to do in 10 years. Funny, lighthearted, socially desirable, ha ha, but still managing to make the case that climate change is very, very bad. The, the gods aren't stupid, they know the rest of the problem, but they need an on-ramp to be able to talk about it. I just want to take a couple of final minutes just to, and I'm not going to ask you to out yourself on who you are because I suspect I know. <laughs> but I just want to say a couple of things finally about how we frame everything, particularly climate change, in terms of this storytelling piece. So at the moment, the story, particularly of climate change, is what I call a Frankenstein story. Man makes monster, monster destroys man. It's a very, very, very satisfying story arc. It comes from the uh, golem of ancient Jewish myth. It comes from um, uh, English morality plays, Godzilla movies, where nuclear power created Godzilla. It's a very, very, very familiar story arc. It's such a familiar story arc. There's almost like a narrative necessity for the bad bit to happen. It's almost as if we kind of want to see that story come full circle, because the story is so, so, so very clear and morally satisfying. Problem is, is that, that if we do see that story through, there won't be any more stories. There's three stories that in society tend to be put forward as alternatives or solutions. One is Iron Man, basically techno saviour that some Stanford dude is going to come up with the answer. Huge amounts of our storytelling is based on an individual, usually white man, technologically inventing something that saves everything. Tony Stark did, in fact, invent fusion. The second would be what I would call Hunger Games, basically youth revolution against this earned dystopia, where youth violently uprise against age and overthrow in order to save the world. Our youth movement at the moment is very large and it is increasingly violent in its terminology. And then Eat, Pray, Love, a way of living which is downsizing, which is smaller, which is living off the land, which is living within our means. This sort of almost sort of a, 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 cult, a cultural desire to actually live more like perhaps a brick would aspire to live. The sacrifice message, the revolution message, or the technological solve message all have some reality to them. We do need technology, we do need youth to step up politically, and we do need to live slightly different lifestyles. But none of those, apart from the technological one, really appeals to the golds very much. And the problem with the technological one is it implies nothing needs to be done because the techno savior is going to come along. So we need new stories. We need a Lord of the Rings story where actually we see this as an adventure, where unlikely allies come together and actually are able to change the world, small people in a way that absolutely the, the rich and the great would never have expected. We need a sandline story, indigenous and traditional storytelling, stories that are not from the story heritage that I'm in, that started with the Euripides, went through Chaucer, and went to Shakespeare, but stories that come from other parts of the world where there already is a way of living in harmony with nature. And the stories can help us get there. We need Evan Bokovic stories. We need to tell the stories of the individuals who are making the change. If within your organization, there is a story you want to tell about a solution, about an activity, about a project, about a program, find a person to represent that and tell that person's story because you'll have many, many, many more people wanting to listen to it than if you start tell the story of the program. And overwhelmingly, we need a story which I call future armor, which is a story that actually, if we solve all of this stuff, shit will be better, not worse. The sacrifice story, the story that we're going to have to sacrifice to get there is one planted by the fossil fuel companies. 
Literally, we are following their playbook when we tell people they're going to have to give stuff up from that. They are dependent upon us continuing to, to um, tell that story because they know very well that as long as we keep telling the sacrifice story, the golds will never come with us, will never vote with us, won't buy with us. So we have to tell the positives. And the positives can simply be you're going to nature because you're going to be eating better. You're going to be less stressed. You're going to be less anxious. You're not going to open your phone and, and see all these horrors. Story that you're going to have better friendships. You're going to be less lonely. You're going to be more connected. Stories that you're going to be thin and healthier and look better because a sustainable diet will do that for you. So don't tell the story of the what. Don't tell the story. Don't, don't paint a science fiction story. Tell the story of how it's going to feel when we actually solve some of these issues, because that's what people want. They want to feel better. And I'm just, and I am going to try to take a question or two if we have time, but I just want to finally end with one thing which I often get asked, which is I tend to be an optimistic person. How have I stayed so optimistic, just like working in this field, working with IPCC scientists, working to see and actually experience? I've been to a fucking oil rig in the Amazon. I've seen how bad this is. How do I stay optimistic? And it, the reason why I stay optimistic is because it's not about me. When you look at some of the greatest change makers through history, they didn't live to see the impacts of what they did. Most suffragettes never got to vote. Most of the civil rights movement didn't get to vote for the first black president. Huge percentages of LGBTQIA campaigners died before we were able to get equal marriage in the horrors of AIDS. They did it anyway, not because they were expecting to see a validation of their efforts in their lifetime, but because that's what being a good person is, is you do it anyway and you don't expect to see the outcome of it. So much of the anxiety, horror, upset, disappointment, bitterness in our community comes from people feeling that they're failing because they are expecting to see you little one human being that you're efforts are making an impact on the wider world that's not how it works you do it because it's the right thing to do you put the efforts in you work hard and you expect and know that the outcomes of those will probably happen after we're all gone i'm about to turn 50 by the time i'm 75 80 we will be at the worst point of climate change i will not see the world which i'm trying to build and that's okay because a sign of a civilized society is when old women plant trees that they know they're never going to live underneath. So thank you so, so, so very much for this chance to close out your conference. That wasn't what I was expecting to say at all. I'm between, I'm between you, you and the pub, so I suspect we don't have time for questions. But if there is one or two, one or two, if there's one or two. We might have one online. Or everyone's, or everyone's going, no, I want a beer. We have one online. Let's do that one. How do we best nurture people on the ground so that we can empower them to tell their stories? Story finding is often my hardest task when it comes to them, to them being people led. Yeah, it's such a great, it's such a great point. There was a point made earlier that um, so many of the stories, particularly in frontline communities, don't get told. And that has been a horror and a reality in every change movement that the stories of the front line don't get told and that it's other stories that do. So one of the things which you will find that of course all three groups is that they are prepared to tell somebody else's story. So when you go to someone and say, can you tell me your story? It feels quite intimidating. It feels quite overwhelming. When you go to someone and say, can you tell me the story of someone in your community or someone that you're working with? Is there someone who you think is pretty cool and could you tell me their story? People will start to tell their story, tell the other person's story, a friend, a family member, a fellow community organizer, somebody else that they knew, their grandmother. They'll tell you somebody else's story. And then once they've warmed up, they will tell you your own. So it's my very, very, very simple question is don't ask people for their story. Ask people for somebody else's. And people are always much, much, much more enthusiastic to glorify and uplift and talk about somebody else's story who they know who is amazing. And then sometimes you can get them to tell their own. So I would really recommend at the pub, tell each other your stories. Tell each other stories that you've heard. Tr tell each other, don't, don't talk about the abstract, the big, the impactful, the, the, the insight. 
Talk about the human, the personal, the tiny, the, the honest, because literally that's what human beings have been doing probably before we even invented language when we were making little shadow puppets in the dark. And it is probably the most human thing to do is to tell stories and you just gotta let it out. Thank you so very much. Wow.